And here we are, episode 17 of Quark's Insights. And this time about talk about a stork. Uh, but they will get, I'm probably pronouncing it incorrectly. But anyway, uh, we've got three people. Um, uh, News-wise, I don't have much to cover. Uh, so I think we just kind of jump right into it. Clement, everyone knows, well, that up there in the corner. Um, Mr. Reactive. And then we have uh, My Michael. You've been here before, but maybe you can just give a short introduction. So my name is Michal. I'm I'm uh, work. I'm in the Quarkus team, and I mainly do work around uh, REST client and REST client reactive and gRPC. Awesome. Where are you located, by the way? Poland. Totally Poland. Poland. I didn't actually realize that. <laughs> cool. Anyway, Aria, who are you, and how do you get here? Hi, uh, so my name is Auri and I work for the Snowdrop team in, in Red Cat. That is where we try to improve the developer experience for Spring Boot users that want to take their applications and deploy them in Kubernetes and OpenShift. And recently I have joined Michal and Clement and I'm working also in Stork the project that we are introducing today. Awesome. And Mikael just had a few things to go out for, but he'll be back in two seconds. Um, <laughs> well, that's great. Um, oh, and he was like, about supposed to start. That's good. <laughs> okay. uh, so anyway, the, the, the idea is that we're going to talk about this stuff. Anyone who's here listening on Facebook and Twitch and YouTube and Twitter, wherever they are, you guys can put questions into the chat, and I'll relay them to, to here. Uh, we will talk a lot about Stork and gateways, I guess it is, API gateways. Um, but, you know, ask away and we will, uh, anything related to Quarkus, we will help you with. Um, and there we go. Michael is back. Just in Sorry. time. <laughs> uh, Sine, uh, let me get, see if I can get this nice again. There we go. Um, so you guys want to talk about what Stork is? Who's want to take the word? lead yes so um i'm trying to present the problem that we we try to to resolve with stork so uh, currently in distributed systems the applications typically need to call each other in the past the service location were often hard-coded in the application configuration but nowadays in the microservice architecture, applications are running in containers, so they have dynamic locations. They are created and destroyed at any time. So these locations um, have to be discovered and calls to them needs to be load balanced. In some cases, service discovery and load balancing are provided by the infrastructure, like in Kubernetes, for example, but that's not always the case. So we have a solution uh, called uh, Stork that Michal can tell us more about what um, provide. Yeah. So, so to address the problem, we created a new project called Stork, small right Stork, actually, um, and it brings client side load balancing and service discovery to Quarkus applications. Uh, it is currently integrated with Quarkus REST Client Reactive and gRPC. And it comes already with, with console, Eureka, and Kubernetes integrations. But the main strength of it is customization. So you can easily create your own service discovery and, and load balancer implementation. Um, so yeah, it is currently like. Quarkus is currently integrated with it, but it is vendor agnostic. So you can easily use it with other libraries and, or even standalone without without any uh, container. Um, yeah. Um, so I'd like to show a diagram Clement uh, drew for, for Stork. Um, Max, could you switch to my screen? Yeah. There you go. Uh, so what, what Stork gives you is a, a single entry point, um, a Stork object um, that has a, from which you can get services. 
and these services, stock services, have their names, so you get them by names. And each service has a service discovery, and it may or may not have a load balancer. And service discovery with service discovery, you can get uh, a list of service instances, and uh, yeah, a load balancer can can pick one of the service instances, uh, for example, to make make a REST call. Mm -hmm. Uh, but just, just so, just want to get so this, this is something similar to what are there? Like the, I guess there's other stuff like this, right? Well, it, it, uh, Max, you 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 probably remember the, the good old time of Corba and GNDI and things like that. I, I didn't go all the way back, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> but Corba adds those kind of, of, of things, at least in terms of service discovery. You you, you yeah. were locating objects in a, in a registry. GNDI was also there to locate objects in their own uh, view of the world. Um, but um, the thing is, today in modern architectures, uh, where we do a lot of HTTPs and things like that, there is no real way of doing that. Um, so there are infrastructure pieces like uh, a console or Kubernetes that can handle that. But every time you need to use something different, um, there are no real uh, built-in framework for, for doing that. So you have to configure it or do it, it yourself. There are Sometimes it's, it's hidden inside the, um, the client you use. Some HTTP client, for example, will do the discovery for you and run Robin for you. But we wanted something a lot more customizable than this. Yeah. OK. Got it. Um, yeah, so I think I'd like to, we'd like to go through to the demo mm -hmm. right now, unless, um, I don't know, guys, you have some questions. Um, so, uh, what, what, uh, what I'd like to show you is how to do something like this. It will be simple. There will be a, a blue service and a red service, uh, uh, sorry, pink service. Both are instances of, of a, some REST service. And then there will be, there will be another client, uh, service uh, that is called REST client on this picture uh, that will just do some REST calls. And uh, yeah, so this is basically it. We will start from with, with console and round robin. So let me jump. And just be curious, when you you hear you say HTTP, is it just for HTTP traffic or other things? Um, so it's the uh, Stork is protocol agnostic. It just provides information about uh, locations like host name and port, and uh, any labels a service instance may have, or information if the communication should be done via a secure uh, channel or not. Yeah. And whether you use it for HCP or something else is, is up to you. But both integrations we have, GR, which is gRPC and the REST client reactive, are HCP based. REST client is HTTP 1 and, and gRPC goes through HCP 2. So uh, as uh, Michal said, it's, it's agnostic. However, in the Quarkus integration, we are focusing mostly on, on uh, the dynamic services you may use, so mostly in, in the world we're living, it's mostly HTTP services or gRPC services or HTTP2. Um, uh, GraphQL is coming. It's something we are working on uh, and such kind of things. We are not uh, planning to do that for your Kafka broker or for your database because they, they tend to be a little bit less dynamic uh, in the sense that they are moving less. Uh, moving a database is always a challenge. So that's why we are uh, picking that. Um, as a main use case, but yeah, well, you you could use that. You could use stock for for anything. Yeah, yeah, and just and just just to to um, uh, what would you say um, cover like the the one question I have is like, well, what doesn't Kubernetes do this for you? Like, what why do we have it to have it on the client? So uh, yeah, Kubernetes does it. Uh, but you can still using Kubernetes. You have some. You may have some uh, specific requirements. Like I know you can. Uh, uh, your your client can be closer, physically closer to some uh, server uh, service in a in in like 
on one node than to, to a service on another node. Uh, using Stork, you can have a load balancer that would select uh, something that responds faster, for example. Yeah. So basically, yeah. Kubernetes will do the service discovery, looking for a service and, and having a, a pool of pods behind it. So that works great. But in terms of service selection, it's not great in the sense that it implements a round robin. And mm -hmm. sometimes, as Michel say, you want something a little bit more fine-grained than this. Um, the best, the, the goal is to select the best instance. So the fastest, the, well, the, the one for you, the current core, which is not necessarily easy to do with Kubernetes. Yeah. And I guess, I guess the other one is also that not all Quarkus apps, even though they're cloud enabled, run in a community instance. It could also be a CLI. It could be uh, running on an Amazon Lambda or something else. So that, that's that's why we need that kind of abstraction. Yeah. And I and just I want to make sure I'm not saying the wrong thing. But so even if you're using Stork, running on you, sorry, even if you're using Kubernetes, <laughs> sorry, that's wrong. Whether you use it or not, is Stork allows us to actually, you know, have one interface. Uh, but when you run on Kubernetes, you still can use Kubernetes as you could today, right? To do a discovery and and if you don't change anything, you do, you don't see Stork. You don't even you don't even have access to it. Um, so it's not like we are abandoning Kubernetes. It's just we enabling uh, a bit more flexibility. Yes. Exactly. yes, exactly. We will see it in the second part of the demo. Cool. All right. Let me try and shut up for two seconds and give back the screen to uh, okay. to so uh, we, Michael. Here are here is the blue service that has a chart of of requests it handled, and a pink server the pink service with the chart of the requests it handled. Uh, what I'm starting at with is a just a, a REST client reactive. Uh, so actually, a REST client like micro, right, Microsoft micro profile REST client. Uh, I have the client configured to talk directly to localhost AET 406, which is the blue client. And I have also a, a resource that uh, controls firing the requ requests because if I click here, then the client will start uh, calling the configured service. So. As I configured it now with to talk with localhost 8406, it all goes here, right? So I'll just stop it and show you how it's how easy it is to change it to Stork. So what we need to do first is to change the schema from uh, HTTP to Stork, and then okay. the address of the of the remote endpoint with the name of the Stork service that we want to use. I will use my service. So remember that while here, Michel, do it directly in the IDE, you can do that using the application configuration or even using environment variable system properties or any config source you want to use. Well, first use console. Uh, to configure Stork to, to, to work with console, I just have uh, my service under, under uh, Stork prefix. And I say the service discovery for this my, my, uh, my service is console, and I also should point to uh, the console inst uh, instance. It's on localhost 8500. Uh, and what I also need to do if I use uh, REST client, I need to also have a load balancer because the service discovery may return a lot of services. So I need to a way to uh, pick one. So let me do this to use round robin. And I also show you maybe quickly that I indeed have uh, this console and it has my service here and has two services under it. So let me refresh this up um, and let's see what happens if I click here. Um, as you can see now, both services, services are called equally. Each get 10 requests per second or per half a second i don't know per second i think um that's because this this is round robin right and um, there's maybe one important thing that i i forgot to mention uh because other than the configuration changes i had to do here uh to use it to use uh rest client reactive with with uh, console and and stork i also need a dependency on smaller structure service discovery console. 
and I also have a dependency on on uh, slow bounce around Robin for Stork. And that's it. So, so while here, Michel has a version since the next version of Quarkus, it will be the there, there is a stock extension, so you don't have to put the version of these dependencies. Yeah, the main platform. Yeah. yeah, it comes from the bottom. Yeah. Yes. Uh, just uh, can you go back to the source? Just two seconds. I just want uh, the client the client source. Yeah. So here you put the URL stork my my services. I'm just curious. Does does stork work in the way that if I actually used normal URL connection in Java and use stork to connect, would that work, or is this a specific behind the scene rewiring thing? Mm -hmm. It's it's done on the SVG reactive level level. So it's uh, it doesn't do any magic to okay, uh, on the uh, for for the JDK. It's yeah, okay. just uh, integration is done in REST is active and in the in the Quarkus gRPC for it. So, so I, I I was thinking about trying to do that at your uh, scheme URL handler URL scheme handler directly in the JVM, but yeah. singleton there is a few issues. Native is one of these issues in that case, so it's not that simple for now. We do it like this. Maybe later uh, we will yeah, do it. Could be an option to do it for you. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Uh, I've got a question from Jay Jay Varel. So, is it good to use Dork for Lambda or going serverless? I guess I'll follow that you guys answer. I have zero experience with AWS uh, and Lambda, but. Uh, if you are calling multiple services from your Lambda instance, then I think it would be okay. Uh, it would be good to, to use Stork for it. I know if you guys have any experience with So the, there is no constraint. You can use Stork inside your Lambda. There is no problem with that. Um, the thing is that generally Lambda are, uh, the, the lifetime of a Lambda is relatively short. So what Michel is going to show next is how Stork is accumulating data about the services to select the best one. In a Lambda, that doesn't really make a lot of sense because you don't stay alive uh, enough. But Stork, per se, yes, you can use Stork in a Lambda, discovering services from Consul or from uh, even the, um, uh, um, the uh, service registry from, uh, from Amazon and so on. Yeah. OK. Uh, Okay, uh, another thing I wanted to show you is an experimental load balancer we have. So uh, if you ch switch uh, around Robin here, here to least response. Oh, response time. Uh, I thought you were going to say least responsive, but uh, okay. <laughs> uh, and start sending requests again. It will actually try to use the the uh, instance that it that responds fastest for it, and if uh, so, right now it seemed that the blue service handled the first request faster. That's why it, it gets a lot of traffic now. But if I uh, do add some delay on it, for example, ten milliseconds, then the pink service will start getting uh, requests, and if I start enforcing errors here. Then the blue service will be used again, and so on. If I increase the the response delay here, then it should be on the blue service again, right? And, and that's where you see that it goes beyond what Kubernetes is providing by default, because typically Kubernetes won't do that. Um, so here, you, it will select the best pod uh, for you based on on these statistics, which is quite nice. And actually, you can. Implement your own if you want more fancy things. And, and just to make sure I have the, the topology out of my head. So if I was on Kubernetes, would I then put Kubernetes in my discovery provider? or the, what Yes. The was? And I will let uh, Auri take over now to show you oh. how it's done. Uh, we got, just before we do that, I had a question from um, Benjamin Raimondi. Uh, can Stork use multiple discovery in the same time, one console and one Kubernetes with resolution order? Uh, at the moment, yes. no. At the moment, you can use uh, s s like I don't know console for for one uh, client and Kubernetes for the other client. But we have it in, on our roadmap, the world map, and and I think quite soon to create a solution to let you use multiple uh, service discovery solutions for a single service as well. But 
Uh, actually, that's uh, 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 Benjamin. If you can uh, open an issue on stock, explaining your use case for that, because if it's not done today, it's because we didn't really see a use case behind it. We we see that it could be used, but we really want to have a um, yeah, okay. uh, to be sure that we could, we we have the right requirements. Yeah. Uh, actually, there is an issue for it. It's uh, I uh, Max, could you paste the yeah, uh, link over. for it? But if you could add some information to it, uh, that would be great, yes. Oh, Ari, were you saying something or are you? No, no, uh, just the, the part after the Kubernetes demo. Okay, so I'll turn off uh, Michael's screen and get back to yours in just two seconds. Okay. There we go. You might so... have to zoom in a little bit, Ari, because it's still... Okay, you go on first. Good. So, okay, I'm going to do the same demo that Michal did it, but uh, in my case, I'm I have the the microservices deployed in a Kubernetes cluster. Nice. Okay, so this is the architecture. I have my REST client that is configured for using Stork to resolve the service. Uh, I will see that I have the Kubernetes in the service discovery for a service called REST service and a round robin balancer. And in the cluster, I have a REST service that uh, has two pods. I have the blue pod and the pink pod. So uh, this is the architecture. I'm going to open the code. Uh, I'm not uh, live coding because the the deployment to Kubernetes is it takes a sure. little more time. So I just show the code. I have my client my client here where I configure it stock for the REST service and the applications properties where I have just, is just the configuration for deploy the, the service in the Kubernetes cluster. And this is the configuration that I'm interested in. The service discovery, I will use Kubernetes and round robin as load balancer. And yes, basically the, the, have... there's no client side or even, yeah, there's no client side change. It's just pure configuration you're doing at this time, right? Yeah. Yes. So here I have the three UIs uh, where I just change the labels in order to be sure that I will, I I had shown the correct application. So this is my client uh, that is exposed in in an ingress address and the pink service and the blue service as the um, the REST services. If I start to call, I can see that the calls are received by the backend services. And as I am applying a, a round robin balancer, it's going to, to do the 50% the it. So here uh, I have exactly the same demo that uh, we did in local with console, but in uh, three microservices deployed in a Kubernetes cluster. I must say I love and the demo. <laughs> I like the graph. <laughs> Me understands. <laughs> I spend and the most time on I... the graphs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot also to to indicate that I just changed the dependency that um, that my project is using. I'm using the small stork service uh, discovery Kubernetes and the round robin load balancer. So uh, the only thing that changes uh, is this dependency and the configuration of the application, but the rest uh, is the same that the other one. 
Can I can I add both just because I'm lazy and then Quarkus will take care of only taking the one with me I need? Sorry, can you repeat? <clears throat> so I'm saying like it, it's one of the rare cases where we it you kind of might want to have both of them. The discovery communities for the production and discovery um, what it was called load balancer uh, around wrapping for your development. And I'm just wondering if if by adding both uh, the resulting jar I assume will only contain the one we actually need. Is that uh, mm -hmm. how 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 much baggage do we get by having both of them? So the the jar like um, if you add both to your application, you might even will package both of them into your application, right? Uh, if you if you add it to the test sco test scope, you will have it in the test scope, right? Uh, but you have you can have them both. It doesn't cause any conflicts, and these are this this may be these rather are rather small jars. So and if you build okay. to native, they should be removed. Uh, the yeah. one that you don't use should be removed. No, I they're think. not no. because ah. it's a runtime property. Yeah, true. And we want ah. to keep the possibility to switch uh, your strategy yeah. at runtime, which which explain why we will oh. pack all of them do inside your native images. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is but well for me at least. And again, stock is a very new project. It's something we are working for maybe a few months, and so we're still collecting things. For me. Uh, these strategies are definitely something you can decide at one time and not a build time thing. But yeah, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm listening to every argument to say to that says that it's a build time uh, strategy. I, yeah. Honestly, I don't necessarily know. Yeah. Yep. Okay, that was my other question. Like, can I change strategy while I run? Uh... There could be case where that might be interesting, but yeah, yeah. It's just about the config property that says which yeah. type of service discovery you want to use. And, and, and as you said, these are not like a, a full JWC driver dragging in of like whatever magic. This is literally just a few classes. It's you know, two well. classes. Uh, yeah. To have implemented uh, service discovery I'll by myself alone, uh, <laughs> it's two classes. I was able to do that. Yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, about this having multiple ones on the class path, we are thinking of simplifying the config. If you have one, so that it uh, it is automatically selected, yeah, the one you yeah. have, and then using the service name you have uh, as the service you ask the service discovery for. But it's it, we don't have it yet. It's in plans, yeah. and yeah. then we still may may uh, use this composite uh, service that. Mm -hmm. Gathers services from service discovery that gathers services from multiple service discovery providers oh, okay. when someone but, has multiple. So. But it does sound intriguing to just be able to just like we do for DWC and others. Just oh, I have a Postgres and it's a Postgres driver for data source. Yeah. And here it's like saying, okay, you have you have Ram Robin that we're going to use because then uh, you just have to for all the basic cases you just have to add the right dependency and no configuration. And as soon as you start doing multiple ones, sure. Let's make it complicated, but not. <laughs> we are we have done the same thing for for small wire reactive messaging uh, connectors now. If you have a single one and your channels are not managed, it will pick the default one. So it's something we are extending to to every well, to every place where we have such kind of things. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to sh show now how to actually implement a custom service discovery because. As I mentioned in the beginning, I think this is one of the strongest points of okay. uh, the two classes sort of... that Clement could write. Right? Yes. Yep. Uh, I'll show you. It's like to show it. I implemented a very simple service discovery server. It has a REST API that just uh, if I asked for 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 service for a given name, which is configure service in this case, I can get uh, a set of like. A list of, of such JSON entities that have the the name, some labels, and a URL. So you, you mostly were implemented Eureka. Yeah. Uh, okay. So what do I need to do to have a, a service discovery for my uh, service discovery server? I need to implement a service discovery provider interface, and I will call it simple service discovery provider because. I think it's simple. Uh, and so it has to implement service discovery provider. Uh, 
and it has two methods. One method is, is a type, uh, let's call it simple. And the other method uh, actually creates a service discovery that provides, like based on the config it gets here, it will create a service discovery that will provide service instances for the config. So uh, for my service discovery server, I will need a URL of the service uh, of the server. So let me uh, get it from the config URL. Uh, I'll just quickly add a failure if I don't set the URL so that we know what's wrong if I if I do it, because I often do it. Um, so throw new illegal argument exception. So service discovery will not provide it. And this is one thing that I need. Another thing is some service name. I will call it service, not to conflict with the service name passed here. So let, let me config parameters, oops, parameters get service. And again, if it's no, let's fail. Uh, Yeah, and just so what we implement now is basically custom routing logic, right? Uh, this is uh, logic that will connect to our service discovery server that select that returns oh, okay. a list of services for a given okay. name, okay. Uh, and we will we'll just pass the, the the list of service names to our clients, okay. uh, basically. Okay, so need to return some service instances. Uh, so to do this, I'm in a Quarkus application, so I will use REST client reactive to implement it. Uh, but you could easily use, I don't know, Vertex, Vertex HTTP client if you wanted to uh, keep uh, low level. Uh, so let me just client for my, I'm cheating a bit with, with live templates, not to bore you guys to death. Uh, so the client for my uh, service discovery server looks like this service. Uh, so the mm, service discovery informa so information is on path services, right? And, there, and then there is a path param with service name. And we are just getting a list of service DTO, DTOs. I'm returning a uni here because I want it to be done in a non-blocking way. It's really important for if you implement uh, service stock service discovery that you don't block uh, because the uh, clients that use service discovery will assume the code is not blocking. They can invoke it on the on an even on the event loop. So yeah, yeah. it has to yeah. be blocked. It's, it's a very hot code path, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's construct a client that would actually do the call. So client client. Uh, REST client builder, and then base URL is the URL created from this. Oops. And then let's build it from the client class. And here I can just do client services for the service name I have also taken from configuration, but I need to map the, 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 the these DTOs to stork service instances. So yeah, again, a, a bit of code. So what I'm getting here is a uni of lists uh, of some list. So I let me do on each item in this uni, and there should be only one item. I'll, I'll transform this uh, instances that are there with Mm, I think like this instances stream map uh, and then uh, DTO and some tool stork service instance method accept the DTO and return it in in a in the stork format. So let me cheat a bit again on this to stork service instance method. Um, Okay, okay, oh, oops. And I will explain what happened here as well. Oop. 
Oops, there's something wrong here. Oh, I need to collect it again, right? The list. So I, I got a list of DTOs. Yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. And each of them, I, I take the service DTO and I translate them, translate it to default service instance. Um, default, default service instance is the default implementation of the service instance uh, interface that we have for, for service instances. So uh, the blue service or the pink service are service instances in our case. Right? Okay. Uh, and here we have, we just unpack the URL that we are getting in this JSON, right? So here, uh, unpack the labels. And that's basically it. I'm not doing one thing here that I should be doing, but I don't know if, if I should waste our time on it. And because here there are service instances, uh, each service instance has an ID. In, and the way I do it is that on each refresh of this data, on each fetch fetching of the service instances, I will give an, an, a new ID to the service instance. Um, these, these IDs should be preserved, uh, but the, the service discovery implementations we had have examples for this. Okay. So anyway. So that, that really, there's a question from um, Benjamin here is asking, is, is there a cache for this resolution? Like the store cache it or yes. it up to the provider? Yeah. So right now, yeah, as I said, I'm cheating, cheating a bit, uh, but there is a cache, caching service. Uh, caching service discovery, I could be mm -hmm. uh, extending myself uh, instead of the, the service discovery itself. And this caching service uh, discovery uh, fetches the instances, then caches them for some period of time, and then refetches it uh, okay. after the period of time has uh, expired. But um, generally, uh, yeah, the the service discovery. If you if you do service discovery, not the caching one, we, um, it won't be cached. This is because okay. I imagine in some cases you may have, for example, server push on updates to service discovery. So someone may want to implement it totally differently, right? Than we hmm. uh, do in the current. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 so just so Stark itself doesn't cache. It's up to the provider, the call provider. To, uh, to, yes. to do it, right? So Yes, but we yes, provide but, an abstract superclass that yeah. does the caching, right? Sure, sure. Uh, in, the, in the case of console service discovery and Kubernetes, they are, uh, they are cache. And Eureka as well, I think, right? Come on. Yes, I think. Yes, um, yes. And so the what, what period, you... sorry, the period of refreshing is, uh, of course, configurable. Okay, so the ones that we provide out of the box currently has caching mm. in them. Yes. Mm. Cool. But, but as Michel said, it's we don't want to have caching for everything because yes, yeah, there is some service discovery backends that where it doesn't make sense. A DNSSD or everything where you have push events, then there is no need for cache. You just have your your local list. Got it. But he, but even. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, it's dependent. Okay, so let's get to the config. So now if I want to use my new service discovery provider, I need to say that I want a service discovery simple. I need to configure the uh, URL of my service discovery server and the name of the service. But I need to do one more thing, which is actually letting Stork know that I have this service discovery provider implementation. And this is done uh, via service loader mechanism. So I have to do uh, meta inf services, and I hope I will. Yeah, because I was, I was about to ask because you sh this is this is like a nice demo of you know the Quark, like the Re reaction REST client and the uh, API and CDI. I was like, wait, how does the the thing knows about it? So that's the uh, meta inf. Yes. Um, so. Actually, we are thinking of also doing it, for example, from CDI, but yeah, the the first thing that uh, like one of the principles that I had in mind was to be vendor agnostic, and CDI is not always there. So at, at least for the start, we are doing it this way. Right? Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so with with the service defined here, with this config here. 
I should be able to use my service discovery. Actually, I probably didn't have to restart. Yeah, I guess that, that's a point to iterate. So Stork itself is not dependent on Quarkus or limited to Quarkus. It's yes. just that in Quarkus, we've had a lot of requests for something like this. And we were like, well, let, let's let communities deal with it. And now we're back, we're like, OK, now, now we want to do it. And that's what we did. We're using this that you can reuse somewhere else if you wanted to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So right now, we are seeing our requests. Uh, with like uh, with service discovery going through my custom service discovery server. Um, so normally one wouldn't put service discovery uh, code service discovery provider in in the uh, in the in the project, right? But somewhere somewhere outside in some library. Uh, so to show you how how simple a library uh, like this is, uh, I will maybe uh give control back to auri uh, because mm -hmm. she has a he, she has it done in a in a separate project so you can see how like you know right. it, it doesn't require much right okay i'll turn off your screen and go back to our auri okay but, uh, by the way, can, just just before you do that because you uh we have a question here so i don't forget it from jay saying i'm using vendor and architecture where there is a method broker avs in here not sure MPS is deployed on Lambda behind Gateway and Dynamic AVS and further used by AVS Kinesis. How is it good to modify to Stork? I'm not sure if you guys. <laughs> um, yeah, I, Maybe. I, I read this question multiple times and I'm just saying, okay, well, I can see how Stork can be used, but does that make sense? That's, that's a. That's a question because typically Amazon API gateways already has its own uh, yeah. service discovery. So if your application is specific to that, you can just use what they provide. If your application is more on hybrid kind of things that may run outside of Amazon, then maybe stock would be good because you can abstract the fact that you are on Amazon or on Cube or on Consul or, or anything. Um, as I said at the beginning, at the moment, we don't plan to locate uh, other things that uh, uh, APIs or so, uh, gRPC, uh, REST, HTTP, GraphQL, because normally the REST, uh, so brokers and so on, are less dynamic, so they don't move so much. So typically in your case, uh, Kinesis and DynamoDBs, I don't believe they moved a lot. So once you have their names, their locations, that doesn't really move. In a dynamic environment such as Kubernetes, for the pods you are calling, that can change a lot every time you do a deployment or scale up and scale down. So that's why. However, if you have a use case for stock, just yeah, uh, go to the stock project, uh, open a discussion. I would be very happy to, to give you insight. Uh, but yeah, like this, it's hard to say whether or not it makes sense. On the first level, it doesn't sound like it. But yeah, in a special case, maybe. Yeah. Okay, Ari, back to you. Okay, so I'm going to show you how to do the uh, custom uh, service discovery. And in my case, it's going to discover a written service that I have running uh, somewhere here in localhost 1990. I have a written service exposing an endpoint here. If I tape this, I have hello folks. And I'm, I have code um, custom service discovery project able to discover this greeting service. It's a very, very simple project. Uh, I show you the POM and you will see that it doesn't depend on Quarkus, um, nothing, only the small Rai Stork API, because we are implementing a ser the service discovery interface. So I have just it here, and in the sources, I have a service discovery class. Sorry, it's that it's returning a hard-coded address. 
local cost 1990. And the provider with my label, custom, that is what I'm going to put in the REST client side in order to use this implementation. And in properties, there's nothing. I have just the um, file um, allowed to discover this implementation. So that's my custom service discovery implementation. And in the REST client side, what I have, I have a new greeting service. I have my client here, a REST client pointing to this third uh, greeting service and with the path of the endpoint and the method for passing the, the name param. And I have a resource here exposing an endpoint in greeting. Uh, again, then my dependencies, I need to add the my my dependency, the custom service discovery in that case, and it's all. If I start, I'm going to start here the application and um, I'm going to access my greeting service, but via the REST client. So, okay, this one is started at localhost 8080. It's the same that in the other demos, but if I type here written and word, for example, I have, I, I have uh, discovered the written service with store with my custom service discovery and I, I have been able to contact him and everything is running in local this time. Cool. About this API, the fact that we, you have to depend on to do it, uh, it only depends on mutiny. This is the only dependency. Ah, yes. yes. Hmm. Uh, what is it? Just here. Yeah, and the stock API only depends on muting. So ah, yes. Oh. Hmm. Cool. Uh, yeah. So we got we got a question from here from Benjamin again. Uh stock is able to discover existing services, okay, but can I use the register my service on startup? Not yet. Not yet. No, but it's but, something we are discussing because I'm I'm kind yeah. of uh, Pushing the idea. Well, it depends on your provider. Typically in Kubernetes, you don't do that. It's when you deploy to Kubernetes, when you declare your Kubernetes service, that it does a registration for you. However, yeah. for consumer, then yes, you need to register at startup. Hmm. Um, registration is actually very protocol or well, backend, discovery backend specific. If we take uh, a consul again, consul, you will need to pass the name, location, and so on, but also health checks, URL, something like that. So um, we need to kind of classify this and, and, and get it right. But yeah, we definitely want to have some such kind of things for service discovery backends that support it or where it makes sense. Okay. And, and typically in Quarkus, we can imagine in the near future that if you enable the register in my console flag somewhere, then it will automatically register your instances in your console. Uh, so the external URL, external port in inside your console, but also expose the L checks uh, if the L checks uh, extension is enabled and things like that. So it will provide a, a completely okay. seamless built-in experience. There's, there's one more thing I wanted to show. Uh, because I showed how to implement custom service discovery, I wanted also to show how to implement a custom load balancer, which is even simpler. Uh, so again, quite similar to the service, service discovery, you have to implement a load balancer provider. Uh, like since my service gives some labels, I would do label based load balancer. So let's call it label load balancer provider. And it has to implement load balancer provider. 
And so again, there's a type for it. Let's call it label. And it has to return some uh, load balancer uh, for, for the given config. Um, so this, in the config, you'll probably want to have a label. So let's do config uh, parameters get label. Label. I will not add failing for no label now, not to you know waste any more time. But then uh, with this label, we can do service instances. Uh, like the load balancer gets a collection of, of service instances and should uh, pick one service instance based based on that. So let's change them to stream and filter the ones that have the given label. So instance instance labels um contain key label um so labels are a map because in kubernetes you labels are, are a map in for example in console they are not but uh, to to make the structure more generic we we stick with a map uh, in in store and let's just find oops uh find what what's going on here Find first, or else throw an exception, maybe. Uh, so, oops. Like I'll state exception, no service on um, what label. Mike, what were you trying to show here again? I, I lost it. <laughs> I'll implement a custom load balancer. Got it. Okay. So, so we did the service discovery, which gets you all the services instances, and now we are going to select the best one. Yeah. So while it's considered simpler from Michel, it's actually where the, the key logic is because that's where you can implement your business selection. If I want a yeah. service for my premium user, if I want a service that is the cheapest at that time and so on. Yeah, got it. Uh, yeah, again, uh, service loader mechanism uh, to uh, register it. So Let's add a file for it. Um, example, label of parser provider, yes. And now some configuration. Uh, so now we say that my service should use label load parser and not, not round robin. And we want to use the service with label v1. If you take a look here, and the stuff returned from my service discovery server, the V1 is the one on port 8406, which is the blue service. So if I, oops, I need to start the, start the service again. If I start, start my service and start sending requests, we should be, we should see all of them going to the blue service, right? They're going to the blue service, and now if I replace the v1 to uh, here with v2, and yeah, you can see now the traffic going to to the v2 service, right? Cool. So that's it. If it comes to the demo, well, that was easy. <laughs> so, so well, you, you can imagine plenty of, of uh, load balancing strategy, uh, uh, fastest response time, as, as Michel uh, already showed. Uh, but you can imagine machine learning based or whatever. Uh, so this, this is really where the, 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 load, well, the smart logic can be placed. Something to keep in mind in stock is that we won't cover the hundreds of service discovery solutions that exist. Uh, we are not going to implement the thousands of uh, selection strategies that you can use. We want to have something where, which is easy to customize so you can implement your own solution if you need to. Um, typically for the selection, I believe it's where you will need your own when you do uh, fancy things. So that so, uh, it makes sense. So this is stuff like you just want to add the basics, the like, common ones, like Ron Robin or least responsive, oh, sorry, not least responsive, <laughs> least response time. Um, and then if someone wants to like, hey, I want to find a request based on the cost that is recorded in my OpenShift clusters metrics somewhere, that's where people can start doing that. 
and and maybe in the community there might be some that they can share with each other but uh yeah it's yeah. probably going to be very business specific for for these four yeah and and this uh, i don't want to I don't want to underplay like store it's stork is a fairly simple like it's a it's a simple concept right it's just that um uh the, the thing that takes time is to oh what's the right api to contact console and whatever and then the strategies are i guess commonly known in distributed systems since you know 50 well 40 years that's how old am i and um and then uh but but yeah the the the, the, the cool thing is that people i don't when do we have this in Quarkus? When do you plan to integrate this? We that, already uh... have it in Quarkus, in a released version for REST Client Reactive and for gRPC. Uh, right now, the only thing missing from gRPC extension is collecting statistics about response times and failures. REST Client does it, and then you can use the least response time, which takes into account errors and, and response time. And but for gRPC right now you can only use things that don't do such things. Uh, like what, what was that, for that was in Quarkus 2.4, but in 2.5, the ones that will be released Wednesday. Yeah. Uh, don't we have the the uh, metric support for gRPC? Nope, not yet, unfortunately. They don't merge it. Okay, maybe okay. I need to look at the PR again and, and click on the button. There's a class more you have to implement. To so that's, yeah. yeah. Um, I okay. PR, I think. <laughs> but yeah, so it's in two, since 2.4, we've had it, um, but a few things so there. So people can try it out and, and play with it and give feedback. Um, it's still, I guess it, we haven't marked it as stable yet, just a preview. No. Yeah, right. Um, and then uh, Benjamin, who's going to get the big prize for most questions asked this time, which is great. Uh, he's saying, is that default load balancer or is it always specific? There's no default load balancer. You know, at the moment, you always have to specify a load balancer. Uh, uh, hmm. You have a random, like, take, pick one of the three you have. <laughs> <Wrong job. laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, and then yeah, bug yeah. are very, very nicely reproducible. Thank you, Max, yeah. for these wonderful ideas. Oh. <laughs> class I can implement. Yes, I, I know that. Um, uh, one thing that uh, we forget to say is that all our demos are using the REST client integration or, or, or gRPC client integration and so on. But the thing which is great and should not be uh, forgotten is that you can access directly the Stork API if you want. So if you want to use Stork just for service discovery and you don't care about load balancing, you can still use that. Uh, so you, you have access to the to the Stork singleton and then you, you can yeah you can even override the configuration and things like this. Hmm. Okay, so I can even access programmatically. So I don't yes. even have to I can yeah. Hey, I wanna go randomly go pick up on some service provider and then just give me a URL and yes. DDoS it or something. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Sounds perfect. <laughs> Stork, the library to DDoS in anyone else. <laughs> so imagine combining Stork and Gbang. Oh, that would be magical. Yeah. It will be awesome. <laughs> OK. Uh, well, we guess we are at the top of the hour here. Um, oh, that's an announcement from Ari. I'm going to put Yes, it's just the documentation URL. If you can share it. Got it. Uh, and again, if you there is any missing part in the documentation or typos and things like that, please open issues. Uh, we wrote mm -hmm. it very, very quickly using a new documentation system because every project I tried a new documentation system. So <laughs> That's what, you need to do. what was it this time? Uh, this one is using MKDUX. MKDUX. I actually oh, no. like it. I, I may create another project using it. So that will be three projects with MKDUX. Got it. OK. Anyway, uh, top of the hour, we got it. Well, Benjamin asked a lot of questions. Oh, that's others who did too. Um, and oh, and Katya says, not an extension to learn. Yes. <laughs> that's that's how we roll. Um, but I anyway, you know, give feedback. And I know like I, there are in other frameworks that has similar concepts. Uh, and if you try that out and uh, you go to Stork and you find that, hey, this is missing this thing, uh, do let us know. Um, and then uh, we go from there. So anyway, uh, we will sign up for today. So thank you all, Ari, Clement, and Mikhail.
we will end the stream. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you.